Governments can't dictate where people go or where they live. This is a fact that European governments are once again waking up to as they scramble to cope with the large numbers of people fleeing conflicts in Africa and the Middle East. And we struggle to recognise this shortfall because we've tended to focus all of our attention on a thin line in the sand where states are at their most powerful, the border, and more specifically the European and US border. And in doing so, we failed to look at the state's glaring weak spot within. The fact that the moment you leave any border post or checkpoint, most governments won't know where you are, let alone be able to control where you go. Does this mean that people can move wherever they want? Well, no. It means that if we want to know how patterns of movement are controlled, we need to start looking away from the European border and towards place like, places like the developing city. So it's with this in mind that I want to turn your attention to Johannesburg, South Africa. South Africa presents us with what political scientists like to call a puzzle. In the first decade of the 21st century, South Africa became one of the most prolific deporters of foreign nationals in the world, deporting more people on a per capita basis than the United States of America in the era of George Bush. But it did so with a long and porous border and an understaffed, incompetent and corrupt immigration bureaucracy. What made this weak state such a tough territory? So to find out, I spent over five years in Johannesburg, interviewing policymakers, exploring the archives, and most importantly, conducting an ethnography of the state. Now this meant I spent a lot of time riding along with the police as they conducted immigration sweeps, hanging out in detention centres, and more generally, observing the everyday forms of violence on the city streets. Now my goal was to get at the whole host of micro practices which determine who belongs where in a place like Johannesburg, in the hope that I might be able to better walk my way back to a better understanding as to what determines whether South Africa and states generally are able to control human mobility. So what did I come up with? Well, governments do control where we move but in a very indirect way. The starting point for this assessment is that every country has a relatively stable, what I call, social capacity for movement control. This capacity is made up by all those groups that are involved in detecting whether people are in the right place, arresting, detaining and removing those who are not, and immigration officials are one example of such a group, but not the only one. In Johannesburg, we have vigilantes who compelled people to turn themselves in, police officers who took time off crime fighting to chase migrants on the streets, and NGO workers who competed with one another to transport people home. Now, the government couldn't always determine whether this motley crew of actors controlled movement, but it could determine the range of movement control laws that these groups could potentially enforce. In the South African case, these track-switching decisions account for two significant shifts in deportation rates. In 1986, when the then apartheid government abandoned its segregation laws, South Africa's movement control capacity shifted into immigration control, explaining why the country became such a prolific deporter. In the 2000s, when the government began to disseminate crime maps to the people as ways of detecting who was in place and out of place, these same actors began to shift their energies out of immigration control and into the process of weeding out suspected per perpetrators of violent crime. And here's the rub. While the South African government intended neither outcome, its actions nonetheless powerfully shaped the ends to which the country's capacity for movement control was deployed. I use these findings to call for a new approach to studying the politics of human mobility, one that takes immigration policy and borders a little less seriously and looks a little bit more carefully at society's collective contribution to the exclusion of others.